exciting a Bible. The Bible is the most exciting book in the world. And it's the most accurate book in the world. And it's the, it's the smartest book in the world, the most scientific book in the world. And we're seeing a lot of prophecy in the book of Judges. Now, i tell you what I'm going to have to do. We'll get bogged down here forever, so I'm going to hit the high spots in these, this chapter 8 and chapter 9, only chapter 8 tonight, uh, because we'll, we get bogged down, we'll never get through it. So I'm going to hit the high spots here this evening and, uh, uh, of this chapter. We just got through with that great, big, mighty victory of Gideon and his 300s. Men, you were here last week. You got how, we, how he told them men to lay down and whoever lapped water like a dog like that, he'd keep, and the rest of them, he sent them home. He went from 32,000, I think 30,000, down to 300, and God gave the victory to 300. It don't take a big crowd for God to do something. And uh, nothing wrong with it. I mean, the more the better. The more the better. I want more, 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 more people than anybody that don't backslid. But God don't have to have a crowd to do something. Sometimes it's just God and one. Sometimes it's just God by himself. One man said, uh, God and one man and God's the majority. And they said, no, God by himself's the majority. And so uh, all it takes is you being right with the Lord. Now, well, they've been fighting Midianites and and. and uh, here in this chapter, we begin with these words. Chapter 8, verse 1. We're going to hurry now, so you're going to have to listen fast. And the men of Ephraim, as one of the tribes, said unto him, Why hast thou served us thus, that thou callest not us? You didn't send us a text or call us and tell us what you was going to do. That's basically what they said. When thou wentest to fight with the Midianites, and they did chide with him sharply. There's just from Old Testament. Does anybody have a problem figuring out what chide means by the context? They was mad and they did chide with him sharply. You know what that means? They blessed him out. And chide, argue. They argued sharply. Now, here's a study in human nature for you, y'all. They said, why didn't you call us? You got our number. It's in your phone. You should have called us and told us you was going to go. with. You know, what, you know what that's a picture of? Ephraim. And Ephraim done that one other time in the Bible. Was, I think somewhere else over in uh, Joshua somewhere or later on where the, they didn't go fight and then got mad because they didn't call them. Now, look at me. I'm teaching you on human nature. After the big battles won and God gets a great big victory, everybody wants to get in on it. Ain't that the way it goes? Some people are like blisters. They don't show up till the work's done. Ain't that right? And here comes Ephraim, and they said, uh, hey, man, we heard about your big victory over there. Why didn't you call us? We'd have helped you. And, they, and uh, Gideon said, well, uh, I know. You're wonderful. You're great. Uh, some people are like that. Some people, I, I've seen it pastoring through the years. At youth, they'll show up at a youth rally. I'm not trying to be ugly or critical. The only time they want to get in on it is when it's big and great and wonderful and then when the bottom falls out and it's rough and it's drudgery and you're fighting battles and you can't pay the bills, they're gone. But a real Christian and a real church member will stick with their church and their, and their preacher and their men through the hard times, good times, because all churches have them. Yeah, um, sometimes people come to the youth rally and they say, man, I want to move here and come to this church. And you know what I tell them every time? I say, look, it ain't like this all the time. It ain't youth rally all the time. And it can't be. And we don't expect it to be. We have cold services. We have some dead ones. We have some that are just feel like it, pulling teeth. And then sometimes the glory comes. That these people, they, they were mad because they didn't get in on the, on the glory. Chapter 12, verse 1, that's where it's at. Same thing happened again. Joshua 17. Uh, the Ephraim always wanted special favors. Uh, these are people that never fight but always want credit. It amazes me, pastor in a church, you learn so much about human nature. A lot of people always want a pat on the back for every little old blessed move they make. And they want to be recognized. And, pat and that's not wrong. It's not wrong to say, man, I appreciate you. But look, if you do it for the Lord, you're not doing it for a pat on the back. You're doing it for the Lord. Man, I don't, you know, there's times when I preach in here on Sunday morning, we'll have over 300 people in here, and two people tell me they enjoy it. Or two out of 350. Now, if I was like some people, I'd say, well, I'm just quitting. 
They don't appreciate. But you know, I think why I do it. I don't preach to get appreciated. I preach because God called me to preach. And I believe he wants me to it. And if you appreciate it, I'm going to preach. And if you don't, I'm going to preach anyway. You get mad to stomp out, ain't going to change it one bit. My mind's made up. I know what I believe. I know where I stand. And by his grace, that's what we're going to do. Now, you can't get this attitude of, you know, well, I cleaned the flowers and nobody appreciated me. Or, well, I wiped a little dust off that table and nobody told me they appreciated it. You know, you can't, that ain't why you serve God. You don't serve God for the praise of men. And they wanted in on it and didn't get on it. That's a good sign of human nature. And look here what he done. Verse 2, old Gideon said, What have I done now in comparison of you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezar? And uh, Gideon's, basically what he was saying was, Abiezar was Gideon's household, and they got the grapes of Ephraim, the kings of Ephraim, the kings, and he said, you guys are much greater than I am. I know you're wonderful and everything. And they just calmed right down. Uh, verse, uh, God hath delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, or Ibn Zeb, or what was I able to do in comparison to you? He said it twice. He said it twice. There's a good way to do people if you're smart. Brag on them a little bit. And it said their anger was abated toward him when he said that. <laughs> Ain't that something? Big babies. He said, look, I'm not as, I ain't done nothing in comparison to you. You're just, you're just the most wonderful thing. And they said, oh, I like you again, Gideon. I mean, it's sad that you have to be bragged on. But if we're living in that generation that absolutely has to have the praise. Of, and I'm not, I'm not one of these preachers that's good at that. Y'all know me. I'm not good at, at just bragging on people to make you sick. I've seen preachers go and say, oh, Jeremy, you're just so precious. You're not precious a bit. Uh, you know, you're saved by the grace of God. You're my brother, and we're man-to-man -man fighting, amen, uh, the enemy. And that's a study of human nature for you that come in late. Uh, look at that. It's chapter 8, verse 1. Uh, uh, it said uh, they wanted to fight, and they, 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 they showed up after the battle was won and wanted to get the glory. Uh, in verse 2, he, here's, how you, here's how you handle people that are mad at you. You brag on them a little bit. You know, I just really appreciate you. That's what he done. Look, he said, what have I done in comparison of you? Verse 2. Verse 3, God delivered you in your hands. What am I able to do in comparison of you? You're greater than I am. Then their anger was abated toward him. Verse 3, when he had said that. That's human nature if you've ever seen it right there. They did chide with him in verse 1. They blessed him out. As soon as he bragged on them, said, you know, I, I really do like you, Gideon. And I'm not good at that. I'm not good at that. I appreciate people helping. God knows I do. But I am not a politician. And if there's anything I don't want to be, it's a blessed politician. A politician can talk for 20 minutes and you don't know what he believes or who's saying. I heard one, I don't even know who it was, one of the representatives, uh, I don't know if he's Republican, Democrat, or what, and he talked and he said, uh, you know, there's good on both sides, and you know, I see some good in what you say, and I see some good in what you say, and, and, and when I got, when they got through, I thought, well, he's for everybody and everything, and that's a politician's job, is to make you think I look like you, and make you think I believe like you, and make you think I'm agreeing with you, and make you think, I, and everybody said, he agrees with me, he agrees with me, and I mean, there's sodomites, and, and bankers, and lawyers, and crooks, and drug addicts, and Christians, and atheists, and they all think he's on my side when he gets through talking. That is exactly what you don't want in a preacher. When I get through preaching, you ought to know what, what I said. You might not like it, but bless the Lord, you ought to know what I said. And you ought to know, like that old preacher preached one Sunday morning, and that old woman came out, and he said, uh, somebody said, what did he preach on? She said, sin. And she said, well, what did he say about it? She said, I think he's again it. And that's the, way I, that's the way I want people to know. They want to know where we stand. And old Gideon buttered them up there a little bit. In verse 4, and Gideon came to Jordan. He came to Jordan. He bragged on them a little bit. They mailed it and got nice and took his 300 men with him. Look at verse 4. Tons of stuff in all these verses. And, and his 300 men with him were faint, yet pursuing them. There you go, Christian. There you go, Mama. There you go, Daddy. There's your verse to learn and study. 
faint, yet pursuing them. You don't quit just because you're tired. You don't quit just because your bills are behind. You don't quit just because it gets a little rough. Bus workers, Sunday school teachers, preachers, son, deacons, Christians in general, faint, yet pursuing. I tell you, mark that verse. You see how stuff like that's hid back there in the book of Judges and nobody reads the book of Judges? I wonder how many Christians in Burke County read the book of Judges this year. We'd probably be shocked out of our wits. I wonder how many preachers, even a little old verse like that right there, faint yet pursuing. Man, that'll preach. Faint yet pursuing. It's easy to pursue when you feel good. It's easy to pursue when it's youth rally, when it's camp meeting. <laughs> Woo, hallelujah, amen. But boy, when you're faint, when you're faint, you got to keep on going then. And that'll preach, buddy. That'll preach, amen. Stay with it. Stick with it. When you're tired, go. When you're sick, go. When you're broke, go. Uh, you know how far it was that little trip they was going? About 50 miles on foot. or in some. They might have had some chariots or donkeys or something. 50 miles. That's from here to Winston-Salem nearly, I guess. I don't know. Uh, that's a long way, brother, on the, in the desert. And he said unto them, men of Succoth, verse 5, Give, I pray you, help us out here, boys, Loaves of bread to the people that follow me. For they be faint, and I'm pursuing after Midian and Zalmunna, kings of Midian. And the princes of Succoth said, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in thine hand, that we should give bread unto thine army? They're saying, what? No, no, we ain't going to do it. And Gideon said, Therefore, when the Lord hath de delivered Zeba and Zalmunna into mine hand, then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. It's a nice plaster, isn't it? What would you do with a preacher talk like that nowadays? I tell, I keep telling you things were different back then. He said, look, can y'all help us out? We need some bread. My men's faint. And they said, no, no, we're not going to help with Zalmoon and that other fella. And they said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. When we get Zalmoon and that other fella, I'm going to tear your flesh off with thorns and briars. Whew. How long would he last at the first Baptist? Or last Baptist? How, I mean, think about that. That was when men were men and women was glad they was. Amen. Them days are long gone, people. Well, that's why you, can't, you ain't got get men enough guts to fight a war anymore. And I don't want war. I'm against war completely. But Lord, if we do have to fight one, may God give us some men. Of course, all wars are fought now with push buttons, you know. Back then, they fought them with their hands, knives, and swords. All right, let's go a little further. Oh, let me say something. Let me get back to that. He said, I'll tear your flesh with briars, I'm, I'm sorry, with thorns and with briars. And in that part of the world, and in this part of the world, down in Florida, those briars grow right out of the ground, and at the bottom, they're about as big as that right there. And they come out, Brother Wayne might have seen them things down there, rough briars, down around Pensacola especially, in that area. and they'd come up, tent high as this thing here and wrap around a tree or something and you can't touch them. I'm talking about thorns that long. If you try to touch it, it'd stick in your hand and they'd cut them things off and that's what, they, buddy, when you get whipped with them things, you had a whipping. You get, and that's why when they put that crown of thorns on Jesus' head, we picture it like it was a little, little blackberry uh, thorn. No, no. They say them thorns could have been an inch long and they beat them down into his head he said, I'll whip you with thorns and briars. Yes, sir. Yep. That's right. Good. Oh, my goodness. Now, the reason I said that was this. We're living in a time when there's no, people do not believe in any kind of, of, of spanking uh, or anything with their kids and everything. And, and, and what blows my mind is the Christian people just because somebody went overboard and just because there's been child abuse and all that, and that's terrible, that's terrible. Anybody that abuse a child, they ought to put them under the jail. Amen? Anybody that would, would abuse a child mentally, sexually, or physically ought to be put under jail. But there's a right biblical way of corporal punishment. That means a spanking with a hickory switch. Now look, 
That's what we're missing of this generation of kids. And I'm telling you, I know there's probably some of y'all, I don't know this, there's probably people sitting in right here and say, well, I don't believe in that. You're, you're, you're going against the Bible. Let me show you something. Look at verse 16. Look at verse 16. And he took the elders of the city and thorns of the wilderness and briars, and with them he taught the men of Succoth. Them thorns and briars will teach you something. He listened, well, amen. How many of you got a good one when you was growing up and it taught you something? Amen, brother. I told y'all about that time I, when I was little and I set that fire in the basement. And I was in dead sleep, brother, 11 o'clock at night. All of a sudden, a light come on, buddy. Something grabbed my ankle like that and jerked me straight up in the air. And well, whack, my daddy come in. And you know what? That probably wasn't the right way to do it. But I never did set no more fires in the basement. It'll teach you. You know why people won't, don't do right now? They ain't scared. You know why people continue on in their sin? They ain't never been hit hard enough. Let me tell you something, buddy. You get hit hard enough, you'll quit. Unless you're a mighty dumb individual. Now, some people are like a donkey, like a wild ass's colt. That's what the Bible said. And they don't never get it. I mean, they get car wrecks, put in jail. I mean, people beat them up and, yeah, I'm going to go get drunk again. I had a little bad luck last time. You know, listen, buddy, it, it wouldn't take me but about one night in jail, I'd straighten up. I don't know about you. I would straighten up. One time, buddy, one time. I mean, you hit me hard enough, I've learned my lesson. I've learned my lesson. By God's grace, I'll never... I mean, you get burnt on a stove or something bad enough, you'll think twice before you go over again. If, and uh, if that fire didn't burn you, I'm say, now stay away from there. Now stay away from there. Honey, we need to take you to a therapist and let the therapist help you to learn to sell. Uh-uh. uh-uh. Grandpa and Grandpa didn't know nothing about no therapist. And they didn't put him on medicine. They didn't put him on medicine. They, it said those briars and thorns taught them. Here's what he said in Proverbs. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod, that's about that big, hickory switch, of correction shall drive it far. Not your hand, a rod. They're not supposed to fear your hand. They're supposed to fear the rod. Your hand's supposed to represent kindness and love. When you raise your hand, they shouldn't do it like that. You know. uh, they, they fear the rod, people. They fear the rod. And if you... If, if your kid grows up and never gets a whipping, they're going to get in trouble because they think, I can just do anything. All they're going to do is talk to me. Now, that's not the only form of discipline. By no means. You can take privileges away. You can, uh, t- TV, uh, sports, uh, stuff like that, you can take, you can take privileges away. I'm, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. But there are times when only the rod, the Bible said the Lord chastens those he loves. And buddy, when he does do that, I just thought that was real. Isn't that really something that briars and thorns teach? Yeah, for a week? Holy mercy, that's a little extreme. You don't get to eat or nothing. They scooch you something under the, under the door. Uh, look at here. That rod, that'll teach you something. That'll teach you something. Guarantee you, buddy. That'll teach you. One, one lady told me, she said, well, I whip him and it don't do a bit of good. I said, there's something wrong with your whipping. Or he's a wild ass's cold. Or maybe both. I remember old, old Linda Houck, she'd go up there. We'd be behind her on the way to church, and you'd see her reach around and go, pow, in the back seat. I, said, I told her, I said, no, Linda, that's the way to do it. And my daddy said, uh, he said that kid been hit more than Joe Lewis. But, but uh, uh, I'll never forget my daddy saying that. <laughs> and it don't do no good because it, it ain't the right kind. Those briars and thorns taught them. Taught them. I'll never forget my mom took me outside the little Methodist church in Clinchfield when I was about five years old and broke a limb off the boxwood, boxwood uh, bush. Man, that makes a good little switch right there. And man, she just... Mom said, I'll strap them legs. You know, you go to jail for that nowadays. But it's, that's not unbiblical. I'm not talking, I don't talk about wounding nobody and leaving marks on them or bruises. I ain't talking about that. But uh, uh, the blueness of a wound cleanseth away evil is the way the Bible puts it. And uh, 
You're not supposed to beat your kids. Don't somebody take that out of context, show the world. But uh, that's because they're ignorant. But look here at verse 8. And he went thence to Penuel, spake unto them likewise. So men of Succoth wouldn't have him, so he went to Penuel. And they said, nope. They answered the same as the men of Succoth. And he spake unto the men of Penuel, saying, when I come again, I'll break your tire down. You won't help me? Buddy, I'll just come back and tire your city up. Now Zeba and Zalmunna were in Karkor, and their host with them, about 15,000 men, all that were left of the host of the children of the east, and there fell 120,000 men that drew sword. Man, old Gideon took them guys, and they were starving to death, and whipped them. And Gideon went up by the way of them that dwelt in tents on the east side of Nobon, God's be <laughs> and smote the host. For that was sure hadn't jumped on, on me before I saw it. And when Zeba and Zalmunna fled, he pursued after them and the two kings of Midian, Zeba and Zalmunna, and discomfited all the host. You'll see that word in the Bible, discomfit. And that means, man, he tore them up. And Gideon, the son of Joash, returned from the battle before the sun was up. Oh, boy, there we go. The scientists find fault with the Bible because of verses like that. The sun was up. They say, see there, the Bible's not scientific. Everybody knows the sun don't rise. And your answer to that is, God didn't write the Bible for less than one half a percent of the population of the world, scientists. He wrote it for common, ordinary, everyday people. Now, the Lord could have said... He could have said it the other way. The newspaper don't say that. Your morning newspaper on TV, they don't say that. They say sunrise, 631, sunset, 758. That's what they say. You say, well, the Bible's not. See how they find fault with the Bible? Don't ever find fault with the news. They don't put pressures on newspapers. It's common sense. We know we know the earth rotates. Why don't the newspaper put, at 6.30 a.m. tomorrow morning, the earth's rotation will reveal the sun's rays to Burke County, making it seem to appear and rise. See? They don't do that. They say sunrise because everybody knows what it means. The Bible's wrote in common sense so people know what it means. Amen? Listen, people, you don't have to worry about God being scientific. He made the sun. He made the sun. He knows how much it weighs. Don't worry about him. Verse, verse 14. So don't ever let somebody intimidate you saying, see there the Bible said the sun rose. Right, well, so does the newspaper. You going to throw them out? No. And caught a young man of Succoth and inquired of him, and he described, verse 14, the princes of Succoth, the elders thereof, even threescore and seventeen men. And he came to the men of Succoth and said, Zeba and Zalmunna, them dudes that that's called, with whom you did upbraid me, saying, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in thine hand, that we should give bread unto the men that are weary? And he took the elders of the city, and he taught them a lesson. Whew. That don't sit too well. Things was different back then. Can't do that now. And he beat down the tower of Penuel. He kept his promise. There's one thing about them guys in the Old Testament, man. When they told you they was going to do something, they come back and done it. We're going to really see one here in a few chapters. Old Jephthah sacrificed his daughter because he made an unscriptural vow. Look at verse 18. And he said to Zeba and Zalmunna, What manner of men were they whom you slew at Tabar? And they answered, As thou art, so were they. Each one resembled the children of a king. That's an interesting phrase. I didn't get a lot studying that. You know, I've heard I'm a child of the king, a king's kids. They look like children of the king. And he said, They were my brethren the sons of my mother. And as the Lord liveth, if you'd saved them, I wouldn't kill you. If you'd have kept them guys, I hadn't done it. But since you did, and he said unto Jether, his firstborn, up and slay them. But the youth drew not his sword, for he feared because he was yet a youth. Now there's a great study for young people. I preached on that. He didn't draw his sword because he was a youth. He thought, I'm too young. He can't witness, I'm too young. You young people, listen to me tonight. You're not too young to draw that sword. You draw that thing, buddy. Draw some blood once in a while with it. Pull your sword. He was yet a youth. Paul told Timothy, let no man despise thy youth. Just because you're young don't mean you can't use this sword. You memorize you some verses. Uh, you tell them, buddy, I'm telling you, you, you use it. Verse 21, and Zeba and Zelmunna said, 
Rise thou and fall upon us. For as the man is, so is strength. But he said, just go ahead and kill us. And Gideon arose and slew Zeba and Zalmunna and took away the ornaments that were on their camel's necks. They had some kind of expensive something around their, their necks. We'll see earrings here in a minute. Verse 30, 22, The men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son and thy son's son also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. Now, this, this is common. When a man has a big success, he gets offered a big job. They said, we want to make you ruler of us. You and your son, man, God's, you, man, you're great. You're wonderful. Offered him a bigger job, bigger salary, and Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Now stop right there just a second. More study in good human nature, or the bad, good part of it, and bad human nature. Gideon wins this battle, and they said, man, we're going we're gonna, to we'll pay you $175,000 a year if you'll come over with all that. And most people would have said, Woo, the Lord opened up a door. Yes, I'm going to make a lot of money. But I've, I've told people right here in this church and told many of them, just because big money is offered you does not mean it's God's will. Does not. Now, it might be. It might be. I know people that left their church, left their, took a job on taking them out of, out of, the, out of state and everything, just for money, and they paid for it down the road spiritually with their marriage, with their kids. If God ever offered, or if somebody ever offered any of y'all a big, big job in a big city somewhere, I tell you what you better do. You better really pray about it, and then you better check that city to see if they've got a good Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church that you, you could get in and worship and become a part of. You better check all that out. Don't just say, well, the Lord opened up a door because it's more money. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Gideon said, I ain't going to do it. Verse, uh, verse 24, Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request to you that you would give me every man, those men, earrings. What's a man doing with earrings? For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. They come from Ishmael. With earring. Now, there's a lot of mention about them earrings in the Bible and nose jewels. We'll study that some other time. And they answered, we will willingly give them. And they spread a garment and cast every man the earrings. That was worth a lot of money. Weight of gold earrings that requested was 1,700 shekels of gold. That's a lot of gold, brother. They pulled out of their ears. Beside ornaments and collars and purple raiment that was on the kings of Midian, and beside the chains that were about their camel's neck. I guess they had gold camels had gold chains. Lord have mercy. A camel a, a camel with a gold chain around his neck to me would look just like Kanye or or Snoop Dogg or Eminem or one of them. That's that's about par for the course. Camel with a gold chain around his neck. And uh, they they got him off. Now Y'all know how I am, me personally. That's one, thank God I'm glad I'm a boy because I don't have to wear jewelry. I don't wear no jewelry unless I have to. I wear my ring, but I take it off to play basketball and forget to take it, put it back on and she fusses at me. But, uh, and she should. Man ought to wear his ring. Uh, how many of you married men in here do not wear a wedding ring? Raise your hand. There's one, there's one. They're dangerous, I tell you. Uh, if you. If you've hurt your, they won't even let you wear them in a ball game. You hurt your finger and swells up and then they got to cut your finger off. Uh, but I just don't like jewelry. I don't like jewelry. I would hate to have to, every time I go somewhere, I have to put on a stupid tie. I'd hate to have to stick something in my ears and stick something and put on a button. Lord, I'm glad, I'm glad I don't have to. Honestly, you want my honest opinion? I think there's a little something weird about a guy that wears a lot of jewelry. I do. Earrings especially. My opinion, I can't prove it with Scripture, but I know how it started and where it come from. And uh, so, but I don't know, between you and the Lord, I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna run you off if you do, but uh, I don't understand why a boy, if I was a girl, I'd never date a boy that wore more jewelry than I did, i tell you that. I mean, when you come to a puddle, you'll have to take your jacket off and it so he can walk across the puddle. That's the kind of boy you got. And I know somebody gonna get mad when they hear this said, but, I'm preaching here tonight, not them. Verse number, you ought to appreciate it. I, they don't, we don't want soft, acting, sissified men. I mean, we want some men that are men and some women that are women, right? Something wrong with you if you don't want that. Thank God you are what you are and be that for the glory of God. 
Gideon made an ephod thereof and put it in his city, even Oprah. And looky here, what them crazy people done? And all Israel thither went a whoring after it. Soon as they made something gold, they started worshiping it. And I'm going to show you something. When Gideon dies, look what they do. Verse 28, thus was Midian subdued. Old Midian, their enemy, was finally killed. Gideon's ministry was over. He got the job done God called him to do. And I'm going to tell you, you know when I want to die? When I get done what God wants me to do. Not a second early, not a second late. When I'm done, the Lord can take me on. Why would you want to stay here when God's done with you? He said, and the country was in quietness 40 years in the days of Gideon. That's a good man right there. He brought peace. And verse 29, and Jeroboam, the son of Joash, went and dwelt in his own house. Jeroboam's Gideon. And Gideon had three score and ten sons. Man had 70 sons, buddy. For he had many wives. Many wives. We ain't got time to study that tonight. Very quickly, very quickly, let me say this. In the Old Testament, they were, it was common for them to have many wives. Was that God's plan and will from the beginning? No. He allowed it. We know not why. Things are different back then. Uh, sometimes, sometimes women... Would, were, had no way to support theirself. They couldn't, and they they all they married this guy. And he took care of all of them. That's a little weird to me, but that's the way things were back then. It was a different world. Now they had many wives in the Old Testament. The Lord didn't condemn them for it, but he he never. I don't think he ever. Put, one one place he told David when David committed adultery that time. He said, "Look, yeah, I'll give you your wives, plural." And and da 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 and other things I'd give you, and you had to go get somebody else's wife. God never. I'm not endorsing this. Don't you take me out of context. God never got mad at David when he had he had a bunch of wives. You know when God hit him when he touched another man's wife. Bam, buddy, you get it then. Now listen, when he comes to the New Testament, he clears it up and says one. That's why the bishop, the husband of one wife, in the Old Testament they had a bunch. In the New Testament, you can only be married to one woman. They were married to a bunch of them. And that's why all the preachers get confused about that husband and one wife or a preacher and a deacon. And they say, well, oh, so-and-so's been divorced and he can, he can take up the offering and he can pay his tithes, and I, but he can never teach Sunday school and he can never be a deacon and he can never be a preacher because it said you've got to be the husband and one wife. If, it mean, if that means literally one marriage, he couldn't get married and she died. You say, well, it, no, 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 stick, don't back out. If it means one marriage, he couldn't get married if she died. And there's always people fussing about that. Preachers have no clue in the world what they're talking about. Uh, the verses against polygamy, they had multiple wives forever, and they said, look, if you're going to be a bishop, you're going to be a deacon, you can only be married to one. You say, well, I'm not a bishop or a deacon. Does that mean I can have more? No. No, it's your own. Uh, God's plan for you is to be married to one woman and you stay faithful to each other. You know what God's real plan is? One man, one woman, one lifetime. That's God's plan. And if you die at the same time, if you kick out before she does or vice versa and you marry somebody else, she'll come back and haunt you. Uh, but uh, but you, you can marry only in the Lord, Right? You, you might get me on a lot of stuff, but you ain't going to get me on that. I mean, I'm, I've studied that stuff. I've got books on it. I can, t I can hit it from every angle you can think of. Uh, I've had this problem with, some, with a lot of preachers, uh, a lot of preachers who would never step foot in our church listen to me all the time, and the reason they won't is because one of their friends would fuss at them. Oh, I heard you went over to Castle, and they're such a victim of peer pressure as they're like these little Protestant popes running around telling all these preachers where they can go and where they can't go. One preacher told me, he said, look, he said, I can't come to your church. But he said, I hope God blesses you. I hope you run 500. I want the blessings of God. And I thought, man, are you listening to yourself? You ain't even listening to what you're saying, buddy. You say God can be with me, but you can't. That's putting you up there pretty high, ain't it? If the Lord can hang around me, I believe it'd be all right if you did. But you know what, preachers, they're scared out of their wits somebody's going to say something. 
And I learned in 1982 never to do that. If God's hands on a man, the first time I had Ruckman up at New Manna, I'm telling you, you'd have thought World War III started. They come out of the woodwork. They fussed people. A preacher jumped on me at the post office. Some, one of our church members said, ah, he's this, he's that. He's, he brought up this marriage situation. He said, oh, people are going to quit the church. And, I, and it scared me to death. And I got sick to my stomach. And I prayed about it and prayed about it. And finally I got down and I thought, am I going to let these people tell me what to do? Or am I going to try to follow God? And I made the right decision and that's when New Manor Choir took off. That's the Parker family wound up at New Manor on account of that. That move. And I learned a big, big, as a preacher told me one time, he had me booked for revival. And I'll tell you this, I'm going to have to hurry. He had me booked for revival and I was going to come and preach. And the day before the revival, he called me and said, Brother Danny, some of my church members is fussing. Some of my church members mad said, if you come, they're going to they're cause trouble. And I said, well, you the pastor, I'll do whatever you say. And I said, he, I said, well, brother, I, if it's me, I ain't going to let them tell me what to do. I'll listen to them. I'll take advice from people. But they're not going to tell me who I can have preached and who I ain't. And uh, he said, well, I want you to come on and preach and just pray. And I come on and preach. And his son, who had been living out in sin, got right with the Lord. And you know what he told me after it was over? He said, I almost let a couple of church members scare me out of this. He said, I'm so glad we went in and had that meeting. And I, mean, I can tell you story after story after story of stuff like that. There's usually somebody who starts talking and starts speaking against somebody. Well, I think, I, 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 and then it gets back to the pastor, big mess. But at, at, we ain't got time to get into all that. Verse 31, and his concubine that was in Shechem, she bare him a son whose name he called Abimelech. Gideon, the son of Joash, died. Old Gideon dead now. We're through with his life. Look at that, a good old age. See your King James Bible? Old age. He died of old age. That's where that come from. He died of old age. That's how, I don't know if I want to go like that or not. I'll say 90, 90 and the rapture is what I want. 90 years old in the rapture. You can figure out how long that'll be. Was buried in the sepulcher of joy. I don't want to sit around and drool in a rest home. And, Oprah, and the Abizirites, verse 33, look at here. I want everybody to get this. Here's human nature. And it came to pass as soon as he was dead, the children of Israel turned again and went a whoring after Balaam and made Baal bear at their God. Well, people say, well, Gideon must not have been real because as soon as he left there, they went to the devil. Gideon was real. Them people made their own choice. That boy wasn't cold in the grave because they was out there worshiping false gods. There they go again. And the children of Israel remembered not the Lord their God who had delivered them out of the hands of all their enemies on every side. Neither showed they kindness to the house of Jerubbaal, namely Gideon, according to the goodness which he had showed unto Israel. Ain't that something? Here's a man give his whole life. Took 300 men and whipped their enemies. Killed 120,000. I don't know how many thousands and thousands. Served God. Brought peace 40 years. And as soon as he died, they went right back into sin and wasn't even good to his family. You know, I hope if I ever die in a good old age that y'all be good to my family. Don't turn after other gods. Keep the right Bible. Keep the right music. Surely you know better than that and be good to my family. And all God's people say it. That's what a church should do. All right, I'm done.